So let's continue on with forensic DNA. So uh, our first lecture, I told you about the structure. And once again, here's Gertie's um, dog toy. Okay, so in the center of the ladder, that is where the bases are going to pair with each other. Okay, so DNA is made up of four building blocks and we refer to these as bases. And here they are, there's four different ones, A, T, C, and G. And I've given you the fancy names, but you don't have to know those. But you do have to know A, T, C, and G are the four building blocks of DNA. And the way they interact is the rungs of the ladder are actually two bases that pair with each other. And they do so very um, in a set pattern. Okay, so A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. So if you look here, you have an A and there's a T. Over here you have a C and there's a G. So you don't ever see A base pairing with G or C and vice versa. It's always A and T, C and G. We refer to this as complementary base pairing. And this is what I'm talking about how, you know, um, when I talk about base pairs, that's what I'm talking about in DNA. So yes, you need to memorize the complementary base pairing rules because they're going to come up on a quiz slash exam. Um, I'm also going to assign you a base pairing activity to go along with this. So the pairs, a, 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 A's and T's and C's and G's, um, make up the rungs of the ladder. And that's really where the important information of DNA is. And then these little orange bars um, represent that big backbone that protects the base pairs. So let's talk about structure and function of your DNA. Okay, so DNA contains units called genes. And I'm sure you've probably heard um, the word gene before. So the definition of a gene is a sequence of DNA. So a sequence of those A's, G's, C's, and T's, the base pairs, that carries the instructions to make a particular protein, a single protein. And proteins are molecules in your cells that basically do everything, okay? So they're enzymes. Um, you know, you've probably heard the term antibodies, um, you know, with the COVID-19 crisis. And, you know, antibodies are proteins. Your muscle fibers are proteins. So proteins pretty much do all of the work in your cells. And that's why DNA codes for proteins, because you need proteins to do anything else that needs to be done. The interesting part about DNA is that only about 1% of your DNA is made up of genes, okay? So, you know, what the heck is the other 99% doing? Well, it's made up of evolutionary, um, you know, just information left over from evolution. Um, it's made up of regulatory units that help your, um, you know, genes function properly. Um, a lot of it we don't know yet. And, it, you know, there are new genes being discovered every day. So, you know, more, more genes will be discovered. However, when, uh, when DNA was first being sequenced, um, it was really all of the research was done in the medical community. And the medical community cares about genes because when genes get messed up, that's where you see different types of genetic disease. And so they were concerned with actual genes. And actually those, those snotty medical scientists um, kind of disregarded the rest of the DNA that you know didn't contain genes. And they actually came up with a term that they called junk DNA. Um, basically, we don't think it does anything, so we don't care about it. Well, awesome. Okay, because guess where uh, forensic DNA markers are found? In junk DNA. So this is why. So if you have a mutation, and a mutation just means a permanent change in the DNA, if that happens in a functional gene that is actually coding for a protein that your cell needs, 
that's going to affect the function of the protein and it can completely mess up the cell. Um, you know, when, when people build up mutations over a lifetime, that's where cancer comes from um, and other types of diseases. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay. However, in your junk DNA, if DNA that doesn't contain genes mutates, it does not affect the health of the person because it's not mutating a protein and therefore it's not going to affect cellular function. So this is awesome because junk DNA can mutate and it basically produces sequences that allow us to tell people apart. Okay, so when you hear, you know, the, the DNA profile from the semen matches the defendant. Um, and it occurs in, you know, however many millions or trillions of people. Um, that's because we're looking at forensic markers that are in our, quote, junk DNA, mutated over time, but it hasn't hurt the person. It just allows us to tell them apart. Um, so, hey, yeah, awesome. You know, it, it's not hurting us. It's, you know, the forensic DNA markers are not affiliated with, with um, you know, a person having a higher level of criminality. They're not um, affiliated with diseases. They simply have mutated over time and we can exploit that and use it to tell people apart. Okay, so yeah, one man's trash is another man's treasure. We'll take that junk DNA because it works great in terms of telling people apart. So the main type of forensic testing that is done in crime labs today is called short tandem repeats. And the definition is it's, in, it's a repeated sequence in DNA where you have two or more bases and they're repeated and the repeated sequences are directly next to each other. Okay, so think of this as like train, uh, you know, boxcars on a train. And each one of the STRs would represent a boxcar. So the individual STRs can range in length from two to 16 base pairs. And they're not in a gene, so you can mutate. You can have, you know, X number of boxcars, and it doesn't mean you're more likely to get cancer or, you know, be schizophrenic or get some kind of disease. You, we can just tell you apart because how many boxcars do you have um, compared to someone else. So we use short tandem repeats or STRs to tell people apart because we will all have differing numbers of these repeated sequences. So think of an STR as like bo a boxcar in a train. So if we say that you have one repeat, it would be a single boxcar. Two repeats, you'd have two boxcars. Um, hooked together and then so on and so on and so on. You can have 17 boxcars or 34 boxcars depending on the location. And really the combination of boxcars is, you know, infinite um, or an incredibly high number. And so that's what makes STRs so discriminating and able to tell people apart with a really high degree of scientific certainty. So Here's some examples um, of S an STR sequence. So the STR itself is the sequence A-G-A-T, okay? So it's a short tandem repeat that has four base pairs. And in this person, it's being repeated seven times. Here we have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, okay? So STR testing allows us basically to tell how many boxcars people have at a particular location in your DNA. So, ugh, this photo grosses me out, actually. So, we get our DNA from our parents. Okay, you guys know this. Um, so, here we have an egg being swarmed um, by uh, lots and lots of sperm. And what happens during fertilization is Basically, the first sperm to drill through the egg is the winner because once a sperm has made it inside the egg, 
or the sperm head, I should say, because sperm are then decapitated once they enter the egg, then it becomes impenetrable to all other sperm cells. Okay, so there we go. There's a sperm cell penetrating the egg. So in each one of your cells that have a nucleus, you have 46 chromosomes. A chromosome is simply a tightly coiled DNA uh, molecule, and it's needed so that all of your DNA can fit. Remember, it's six feet in length, and we have to have it uh, wound up tightly so it can fit not only into one of your cells, but into the nucleus of one of your cells. So you have 46 chromosomes that are in 23 pairs. So you inherit 23 cr chromosomes from your mom that are present in the egg, and then the sperm head from your dad also contains 23 chromosomes for a total of 46. So every single species has a particular number of chromosomes. Humans happen to have 46. Um, you know, we're not at the top of the food chain. I mean, uh, we'd like to think, oh, we're humans. We're the most complex organisms. Certainly we have the most chromosomes, you know, actually not. So um, corn has 20 chromosomes. Uh, bananas have 33 chromosomes. Um, cockroaches have 45 chromosomes, okay? And then, the, you know, and so on and so on. So um, remember that the only thing that differentiates us from banana, cockroaches, and corn is how much of the, the building blocks, the A's, G's, C's, and T's we have, and what order they're in, okay? Obviously, bananas and cockroaches have different genes than we do, um, and that's why we look different. Okay, gorillas actually have more than us and for a total of 48 chromosomes. So here's what a chromosome looks like. Um, it kind of has this X shape um, for, the, you know, for the majority of chromosomes, which I'll get to. Um, and it's just DNA that's tightly coiled. And here's what human chromosomes look like. So we organize our chromosome pairs according to size. So chromosome number one is the largest, and then as we go down the line, they get smaller and smaller until we get to chromosome pair 22, which are the smallest. Chromosome pair 23 are referred to as sex chromosomes because this determines our gender. Okay, so this is what the 23rd pair of chromosomes look like. So an X chromosome is pretty big. It's about, you know, it's the size of, of an average chromosome. And then the Y chromosome is actually much smaller. Um, and the way this is, this is organized is that males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So they look like this. Females have two X chromosomes. And so that's how we determine gender. And in forensic DNA testing, there is a marker that will allow you to determine the gender of where, of, you know, the, the person who left that DNA sample behind. Um, it's called amylogenin, and um, it will let you know, okay, this is a body fluid that came from a male, um, or this saliva came from a female. Um, so, you know, that's very useful as well, okay? So basically, you know, um, for, you know, having a baby, it's dad who determines the gender of a child because no matter what, mom is going to donate uh, an X chromosome in her egg, but half of dad's sperm will have an X chromosome and the other half will have a Y chromosome. So if a sperm with a Y chromosome fertilizes mom's egg, you're having a boy. If a sperm with an X chromosome fertilizes mom's egg, you're having a girl. So it's dad's sperm that determines the gender. Okay, so almost up to 15 minutes. This is where I'm gonna stop um, and we'll pick up with this slide next. Okay, and um, I'm also gonna put online a base pair activity. So look for that as well. Thank you.